Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the CCE MMP seminar. Uh, before we start, I would like to begin with the acknowledgement of the traditional owners and uh, ongoing custodians of the land. So I would like to begin with acknowledging the Warringaka people as well as the uh, Kulin nations as traditional owners of the land on which our Parkview campus stands. I also acknowledge the traditional custodians of the various lands on which you are joining us from today. I pay my respects to the elders past, present and emerging and to the Aboriginal elders of other communities. Okay, good morning everyone. Again, I'm the chair today. My name is Ching Hao Oh, and I'm a PhD student uh, of the CCE MMP at Monash. Today is our honor to have Evan from Brian Kovigan's lab to present his work. Evan received his bachelor's degrees in chemistry and biochemistry from the University of Pittsburgh followed by his doctoral work with Joshua at the University of Pennsylvania. And then uh, at, during that time, he do his work with uh, Joshua to do the structures and dynamic solution MMR methods to grow the lipid protein interactions and fast timescale dynamics. Uh, after that, Evan started his postdoctoral work with Brian K. Kobuka at Stanford University in 2018. And then there he used fluorescence techniques to interrogate GPCR dynamics. And um, later on, more recently, he also tried to do some cloud EM works with GPCRs, which is very exciting. And today, Evan will give us a talk about uh, topic on crowd EM as a tool to characterize and exploit the aerostatic, uh, aerostatics in GPCRs. Uh, before we kick off, I just remind everyone, uh, this presentation or this seminar will be recorded. So, and please keep muted during the presentation. If you got any questions, just type in the chat or ask afterward. So it's all on you, Evan. Great, thank you so much for the introduction. Uh, thanks everyone for the invitation to be able to talk to you today. I'm super excited to share uh, some recent work from the lab, um, some about to be published and some unpublished uh, using CryoEM in conjunction with some other techniques as a tool to characterize and exploit allosteri in G-protein coupled receptors. Okay, so I'll start by telling everyone how to spell GPCR, uh, though from the crowd, I probably don't really have to do this very much. Um, the first part of the talk will focus on using structural and dynamic techniques to interrogate uh, GPCR allosteri. In this case, we'll be looking at the role of uh, receptor activity modifying protein 2, a RAMP2, uh, and its interaction with an inhibition of the glucagon receptor. Uh, this interaction causes extensive extracellular domain conformational sampling, leading to an inactivation at the intracellular region of the receptor. Uh, the cryo-EM structure we used in concert with these dynamic techniques uh, in the presence of RAM2 confirms this extracellular domain uh, dynamics and suggests a route of direct allosteric coupling through the receptor to the interface with G-protein. Uh, the next portion of the talk uh, is some unpublished work, so I'm really excited to share this, uh, looking at some DNA-encoded chemical library screening of the mu opioid receptor uh, to hopefully get some new allosteric modulators of the receptor, and we discovered some interesting hits here. Uh, so we have a new positive allosteric modulator that broadly enhances receptor activation, and using cryo-EM structural biology, we're able to determine the mechanism of action uh, as binding to the active conformation of the sixth transmembrane helix. Uh, we also have a new negative allosteric modulator of the opioid receptor that caps the Narcan binding site in the extracellular vestibule uh, and is active in vivo to counter morphine, uh, morphine effects. So I'll start with GPCRs, um, go pretty quickly through this. So the, the GPCRs are the largest family of integral human membrane proteins. Uh, more than the number of members, they play really important signaling roles in nearly all areas of human physiology. Uh, I'll highlight a few receptors. I'll be talking about the glucagon receptor first as a member of the secretin family or family B GPCRs. 
uh, as well as the mu opioid receptor over in the more more uh, more common rhodopsin like family A GPCRs. Uh, they look like they're a bit different from each other, um, but they both share a common seven transmembrane helix uh, scaffold composed of seven transmembrane helices connected by extracellular and intracellular loops. A hallmark of GPCR activation is outward movement of the sixth transmembrane helix, so TM6. This is something I'll be talking about a good deal throughout the talk, um, so we can keep this in mind. So while there's a lot of structural variation around this seven transmembrane helix scaffold, they do all share a, a similar mechanism of activation. So GPCRs, uh, upon activation with some agonists from the outside, promote this outward movement of TM6. Upon TM6 outward movement, there's a cavity exposed in the inside of the receptor that can then bind to different effectors uh, on the inside of the cell. There's a few different effectors. Uh, G GPCR kinases or GRKs can come and phosphorylate active receptors, and phosphorylated GPCRs can then be recycled and internalized by beta arrestins. Uh, I'll mostly be talking about the namesake um, effectors today, G proteins. Uh, so G proteins can also interact with this uh, crevice exposed upon activation with an agonist. Um, and G proteins in the GDP bound state are acted upon by active G proteins, which can help release GDP from the G protein and facilitate nucleotide exchange, where GTP bound G alpha subunits can then dissociate from beta gamma and promote their own independent signaling signaling cascades. Uh, in this case, I'll be talking about GS, a stimulatory G protein, and GI, an inhibitory G protein, uh, which have different effects in the cell. Let me try to get a laser pointer here quick. And beta gamma can have their own independent signaling effects as well. Um, these can happen before the G protein uh, can perform its own intrinsic hydrolysis activity and cleave its GTP for GDP, uh, whereupon the subunits can reassemble and the signaling process is free to start again. Okay, so I mentioned family B GPCRs uh, a little bit previously, so they're distinct from their family A counterparts in that they have a larger extracellular domain of the receptor off of the end terminus. Uh, family A are more common, so I'll be talking about family A receptor in the second half of the talk. So these are receptors for cannabinoids, adrenaline, and I'll be talking about opioid receptor. Family B receptors uh, largely have this extracellular domain and bind to um, peptide hormone agonists. So glucagon-like peptide and amylin are members, of course, and I'll be talking about the glucagon receptor today. So glucagon binding to glucagon receptor promotes activation of GS uh, on the inside of beta cells in the liver, which can then uh, promote blood glucose release to uh, to the bloodstream. This is an important counter to insulin signaling in cells. Both of these pathways together are really important for regulating blood sugar homeostasis. So some previous work from the lab solved uh, cryo-EM structure of the active glucagon receptor uh, bound to its signaling partner, GS. Um, there are a few potential potentially interesting portions from the study, including a dramatic kinkage in TM6 upon activation. Uh, this is a similar outward movement and kink to what we see for other family B receptors uh, that's distinct from the inactive state of the receptor. So to go along with this uh, super breakage in the helix and outward movement of TM6, there's a large uh, rotation at the bottom end of the of TM6 as well upon activation, uh, as shown here by the rotation of, of F345, which will end up being some of our probes for some later uh, dynamics experiments. This is in contrast to class A receptors, family A receptors that don't kink out entirely and sort of more gradually bend outwards in response to agonist and G protein binding. So we speculate that this, uh, this breakage in the helix causes a kinetic barrier that results in a decreased activation rate. Uh, so here we're plotting GTP turnover for the glucagon receptor and compared to a family A member, the beta-2 adrenergic receptor. Uh, we had to plot these on different axes because it's about 70 fold slower. And it turns out this is a phenomenon not just of the glucagon receptor and the beta 2 adrenergic receptor, but more broadly, it appears that family B receptors are a bit slower to activate GS than their family A counterparts, perhaps due to this uh, breakage in, in TM6. So at the end of this study, we were interested in potentially finding some in vivo interaction partner for the glucagon receptor that might facilitate this exchange, uh, facilitate this activity. So we turn to receptor activity modifying proteins or RAMPs. 
Um, so these play really important roles in modulating uh, a bunch of different behaviors of family B receptors, uh, including targeting them to the plasma membrane where ramps can act as necessary chaperones for folding of certain GPCRs. Past the targeting to the plasma membrane, they can also modulate ligand specificity. So the same GPCR bound to different ramps can have different, uh, different ligand specificity properties. Different ramps bound to the same receptor can also change the signaling properties at the intracellular side of the receptor, as well as change internalization and degradation uh, cycling, uh, as has been seen for other family B receptors. This is best exemplified by calcitonin and calcitonin-like peptide family of receptors, where the ramps can be either constitutive interaction partners or uh, really helpful for changing the signaling properties of their seven transmembrane helix partners. Um, there's also past these constitutively interacting uh, receptors, there has been an interaction with the glucagon receptor speculated previously. So what is this interaction doing for the signaling properties of the glucagon receptor uh, was the focus of the, the study today. Uh, so we wanted to first check in cell that the glucagon receptor was indeed interacting with ramps. So in this case, we worked with Jesper, a great collaborator, to check the co-expression properties of the of the ramp two and glucagon receptor. So when we increase surface expression of receptor, we see an increase in ramp two at the surface as well. Um, and this does not happen for the beta two adrenergic receptor in blue, which is a family A receptor not anticipated to to interact with the ramp. So it seems like these two are interacting at the at the cell surface. Uh, so we wanted to characterize the activity of the glucagon receptor in the presence of ramp two. So to do this, we turn to a, an in vitro assay we call the glow assay. So here we take advantage of this intrinsic hydrolysis capability. So G proteins, as I mentioned before, have this ability to hydrolyze GTP for GDP. GDP bound G protein can then be acted upon by a, a GPCR catalyst, a going exchange factor catalyst, it will help release GDP so that GTP can come and bind again and, and start the cycle over again. So all the assay does here is measure how much GTP is left at various points in time. So we can start with some amount of GTP and mix either G protein or G protein plus receptor um, at T equals zero and measure GTP at the end of the experiment by reading out how much luminescence is left. So stronger signal is uh, lower activity here. So what does this look like uh, in the real world? So G protein alone, in this case, the stimulatory GS protein, um, has some ability to catalyze GTP hydrolysis on its own. And this intrinsic ac activity is catalyzed pretty dramatically when we do the reaction in the presence of agonist bound glucagon receptor. Uh, so glucagon receptor in this case acts as a catalyst and we can read this out by this GTP hydrolysis rates. But when we pre-incubate the receptor with the ramp two, we see a pretty potent inhibition of this uh, agonist and receptor induced turnover effect. Uh, so in cells, we were interested in whether this interaction would also have an inhibitory effect. So here we're reading out cyclic AMP on the y-axis as we can titrate in glucagon on the x-axis. Uh, and we do this in a situation where we've normalized expression of the receptor in the presence or absence of ramp. Uh, as I mentioned before, they have uh, effects on each other's expression. So we wanted to be sure that we were normalizing for receptor expression. And when we do this, we see a four or five fold right shift in the potency curve of glucagon. Uh, and some work I don't have time to talk about has suggested that this potency effect is, is largely an affinity driven effect uh, at the receptor. So past this, we we're interested in more directly characterizing whether the ramp is inhibiting one of these earlier stages of uh, activity, namely the GDP release step. So in this case, in this experiment, we're saturating uh, GS with hot uh, tritiated GDP and watching it release over time. In the absence of receptor catalyst in gray, we don't really see much release at all. Um, but when we have uh, agonist bound receptor in cyan, we can see a pretty reasonable release of GDP upon introduction of receptor. But when we uh, pre-incubate the receptor with RAMP2, we see a pretty potent inhibition of this GDP release rate, implying that some of the biochemical inhibition and in cell inhibition we've been seeing previously is due to a decrease in this intrinsic GDP release rate. So how is the ramp able to do this? Uh, we turn to fluorescence, in this case, uh, environmentally sensitive fluorescence techniques where we can label the receptor, a minimal cysteine version of the receptor at 
some interesting sites uh, along its structure with environmentally sensitive fluorophore. In this case, on the left, we're starting with uh, the really important TM6 for outward movement upon activation. Uh, so here we labeled TM6 with an environmentally NB sensitive NBD fluorophore and titrated in the ramp. Uh, and we can see an, an increase and in left shift in the fluorescence of the attached fluorophore here. Uh, and this is a titratable effect that's consistent with an inactivation of TM6 from some previous work uh, with this construct. Surprisingly, when we put the same fluorophore all the way on the other side of the membrane in the extracellular domain of the receptor, um, at the N-terminal region of the extracellular domain, we also see a titratable increase in fluorescence upon introduction of the ramp, uh, the ramp to the receptor. So it seems like the ramp binding to the glucagon receptor is inducing these kind of widespread conformational changes ranging from all the way on the inside at the activation sensor of TM6 to the extracellular domain on the outside of the cell. So we're interested in a more quantitative assay for looking at receptor activation. So to do this, we turn to single molecule FRET techniques. So instead of a, a single environmentally sensitive fluorophore on TM6, in this case, we're uh, taking advantage of the minimal cysteine and introducing two cysteines, one at a stable site on TM4 as a reference position, and the other one at this activation sensitive TM6. And we can label these with a donor and acceptor fluorophore. So in this case, in the inactive state, you might expect to see these distances being pretty close to each other, corresponding to a high FRET state. And upon activation, you might expect to see a longer distance corresponding to a low FRET state and the active uh, state of TM6. So those are kind of idealized data. What does this look like in reality? So when we label the glucagon receptor TM46 with uh, donor and acceptor fluorophores, we can start to see a pretty high occupation of indeed a high FRET state here that we're speculating corresponds to the inactive inward state of TM6. But there is a pretty reasonable population of a mid FRET state around 0.6. Um, and we can see time resolved transitions between these states, suggesting that they are temporally distinct uh, from each other. This mid fret intermediate state is elevated in population when we can bind an agonist peptide, so glucagon derivative here, uh, that decreases the population of the inactive state and enhances the population of this mid fret intermediate associated state. We also see an increase at a low fret state around 0.3. And this 0.3 population is stabilized completely in the presence of agonists and uh, G protein partner here. Uh, so we're, temp we're uh, associating this low FRET state with the fully active conformation of TM6 that we see from the cryostructure and the high FRET state here that we see with the inactive conformation of TM6 and an agonist associated mid FRET intermediate state. So what happens when we add ramp? So if we add ramp two to agonist bound receptor, we can see a reversion of this mid fret state back towards an inner, back towards a, a high fret inactive kind of ensemble of uh, of TM6. So we seem to inhibit the ability of agonists to promote the the intermediate state. Further, when we pre-couple with RAMP2 before adding GS, we can completely inhibit the GS-induced outward movement of TM6, instead reverting to a more APO-like uh, ensemble for TM4-6 distances here. So it seems like even in the presence of full agonist and GS, this TM6 behavior reverts to this uh, fully inactive conformation, and this provides a pretty reasonable explanation for why we're able to inhibit turnover in the presence of GS with our biochemical assays. So we wanted a more broad scale uh, interrogation of what was happening across the receptor uh, across the receptor sequence. So to do this, we turned to hydrogen deuterium exchange observed by mass spec. So in these experiments, we can add a protonated protein into a solution of heavy water D2O and let those regions in the protein exchange. So regions that are more dynamic exchange their backbone amides much more quickly than regions that are involved in local secondary structure like alpha helices. We can quench this reaction after various points in time and break the protein up into individual peptides so we can have a local resolution of where different regions in the protein are able to take up different amounts of deuteration. We can then identify what these peptides are and do this across multiple time points and get these kind of deuterium exchange curves. Um, and most importantly, for the 
the talk today, we can do this in the presence and absence of binding partners. So in this case, in the presence and absence of RAMP2 and monitor this local backbone susceptibility to hydrogen exchange and changes in hydrogen exchange upon binding. Oops. Okay, so some things that came out of these experiments, uh, I'll talk about the RAMP2 data first. So the transmembrane domain of RAMP uh, highlighted in blue here becomes protected upon binding to the glucagon receptors. This is kind of what you might expect from an inter intermolecular interaction where some portion of a protein becomes more ordered upon binding to its partner. Um, past here, the results started to make far less sense to us. So the TM region of the ramp seems to be more stabilized, but nearly all the peptides that we were able to observe in the glucagon receptor become more disordered upon binding to ramp 2 uh, I'll start with the extracellular domain. So there's a peptide here in the extreme end terminus of the extracellular domain right next to the environmentally sensitive fluorophore position that becomes more dynamic upon interaction of ramp 2 uh, so it seems like it's sort of binding event is fraying the end terminus of this helix. Further, the linker region between TM1 and the extracellular domain also becomes more susceptible to exchange in the presence of ramp, sort of implying that a few of these regions are becoming much more disordered, but that the extracellular domain itself uh, in, in brown here is not really changing its exchange behavior very much. So that means that while there may be some disorder and more of a rigid body kind of movement around the extracellular domain, uh, the rest of the ECD remains pretty pretty constant. Um, some other key regions here are right in the middle of TM6. This is right where the helix kinks out upon activation. When we bind RAMP2, we can start to see uh, an increase in exchange in this really important activation sensor. So this is one of the first measures we have of a, a direct allosteric communication between the extracellular region dynamics and intracellular activation kinetics at the at the inside of TM6. Okay, so we were really interested in solving the structure of RAMP2 bound to the glucagon receptor for one of these kind of less canonical um, interactions of RAMP with a family B receptor. Um, so we formed complex of GCGR um, with RAMP2 in the presence of GS and stabilized a nucleotide-free conformation as we typically do for um, GPCR structure determination efforts. And in this case, we pulled down directly on the ramp, not on the receptor. So any receptor and L and G protein that are present in the sample have been directly pulled down on the ramp. Um, when we do this and do size exclusion compared to the GCGRGS sample alone, we see a pretty nice left shift in the in the molecular weight here. Um, pretty great complexing stoichiometry, and these samples are pretty stable at room temperature for several hours. So following complex formation, we froze some grids, uh, processed data as we normally do, uh, and ended up with around 2.9 angstrom nominal resolution for the resulting structure. Uh, we're able to model pretty nicely all of the side chains and all of the transmembrane helices of the receptor, um, but that's kind of where it stopped making sense. So one of the first things we'll see in this structure is the absence of an ordered ramp two. Um, so you'll remember that all of the glucagon receptor complex that's present in the sample had to have interacted directly with RAMP2, uh, and it apparently does not interact with the receptor in an ordered fashion, and it has taken the receptor extracellular domain with it. So in contrast to our previous structure in the absence of RAMP2 with a fairly well-ordered extracellular domain, uh, we're no longer able to model nearly any of this of the ECD of the receptor. Um, so it seems like the ECD is totally missing from our sample, which we may have predicted from the enhanced hydrogen exchange uh, measurements and solution. To go along with the decreased order in the extracellular domain, uh, we also see a downward movement in the G protein binding partner at the intracellular face of the receptor, uh, global 2.5 angstrom downward movement. We think this is largely caused by a lack of ordered ICL3, uh, the third intracellular loop between TM5 and TM6 that typically forms a series of, of uh, conserved hydrogen bonding interactions with the G-alpha. In our case, we're not only unable to model the extracellular domain, ICL3 becomes too disordered to model as well. Uh, so we apparently lose all of these stabilizing contacts. 
Uh, to go along with this, a really important TCAP motif in the G alpha subunit itself is in a totally distinct conformation from our, our active signaling complex structure we previously solved. Um, so all of these things sort of come together to give us this structure, the hints that this structure is sort of not having many of the features of an, of an active signaling complex. Um, when we dig into the structured portions that we can actually model, we do start to see changes in interaction patterns between a few key residues in the extracellular domain that sort of lose interactions that can potentially be stabilizing for the, the overall topology. Um, we also start to lose interactions with the agonist peptide itself as the side chains move away from the agonist in the presence of ramp, uh, as they kind of prefer to form their own interactions within the helix rather than with the, the agonist itself. So while we see um, all of these local interactions are changing, we're interested in digging into the data set a little bit more to figure out what might be going on. So when we do this with a 3D variability analysis and try to fit our data set to a, a model of structures that best represent all of the particles within the data set, we can start to see some interesting conformational changes and coordinated conformational changes that might explain um, some of our lack of density as well as some of our dynamics results from, from previous experiments. So when we do this, we can model the, the density into a series of structures and the two extremes of one of these uh, movies are, are modeled here. Um, one of the sets of structures in cyan matches pretty well with our previously determined structure in the absence of ramp. Um, but at the other end, we can see that ECD has, has moved pretty dramatically away from the agonist peptide, sort of exposing it to solution uh, in the presence of ramp. And concurrent with this extracellular domain movement, we see an inward movement of this third ICL loop that's also disordered from our single structure and also a loss of interaction uh, with helix-8 and the G-protein partner. Um, so all of these together, the, the cryo-EM and the structural and the solution dynamics experiments can allow us to put together this model of what we think is happening. Uh, so upon glucagon binding, we can select for this agonist associated inward uh, conformation of TM6 that we think is kind of a rotated form of TM6 before the full outward movement. Uh, normally the G-protein can then bind and be activated as it normally is, but in the presence of RAMP2, um, the extracellular domain of the receptor becomes highly disordered, leading to a decreased agonist potency uh, and inhibit activation at the intracellular end of TM6. Any complex that's able to form after this lacks a lot of these key features of productive GPCR G-protein uh, complexes, so we think it's sort of an unproductive signaling intermediate. So why would nature do this? Uh, we think the potential role of this in vivo could be to dampen glucagon potency and signaling in a, in a different cell or tissue type dependent manner. Um, so the liver is where we usually get glucagon receptor signaling, but it's also expressed pretty substantially in the kidney. And the ratio of RAMP2 to glucagon receptor is much, much higher in the kidney than it is in the liver. Um, where the, the physiological response to glucagon may be, may be uh, desired to be dampened. So we're looking forward to um, trying to characterize this in vivo as well. Okay, so I hope with the first portion of the talk, um, I've shown you that cryo-EM in conjunction with these uh, dynamics techniques is a really powerful approach to interrogating allosteric mechanisms in GPCRs. Uh, so for the second half, I'm going to present a story asking the question, can we exploit this GPCR uh, allosteric communication for next-gen therapeutics and try to determine uh, these mechanisms of action with uh, cryo-EM? Okay, so opioid analgesia is what I'll be talking about here with the opioid receptor. So the body has a series of natural opioid peptides, mostly enkephalins and endorphins, that are secreted in response to pain or stress. These opioid peptides bind and activate a series of opioid receptors, mu, delta, and kappa, namely, which can then signal through, uh, in this case, inhibitory family of G proteins, GI and O, uh, as well as arrestins and GRKs, et cetera. Um, and I'll mostly be talking about the mu opioid receptor today uh, as the major target for these analgesic effects. Um, so a lot of natural product opioids and semi-synthetic derivatives and newer uh, fully synthetic derivatives uh, like fentanyl all mimic the behavior of these endogenous opioid peptides. And accordingly, they all bind at a very similar position in the receptor. Um, so they all, here I've overlaid a series of opioid receptor structures um, and just plotted the orthosteric ligands as sticks. 
So they all kind of occupy a similar deeply buried portion here, but there is some ability for different scaffolds, including fentanyl in orange and the peptides uh, in yellow and, and gray here to explore different portions of this pocket. So the definition of allosteric or, or of orthosteric pocket sort of depends on which, which ligand you're talking about. So opioids uh, are very effective at analgesic responses, but extremely overused and deadly. So over prescription over the last 20 or 30 years of largely hydrox hydrocodone and oxycodone has driven a few phases of opioid related overdose deaths over the last 20 years, uh, especially the more potent fentanyl addition to uh, street drug mixtures. So to go along with this Narcan or Naloxone, I'll use them interchangeably, has emerged as sort of our best weapon against these overdose deaths. Um, but it has a few limitations, including it's, it's really fast off rate from the receptor, sometimes necessitating a few additions of Naloxone, uh, especially in cases where high amounts of fentanyl that can last around for a really long time uh, are, are potentially really deadly. Okay, so I'm sort of getting at the idea of what we want to do here is, is go through the opioid system and try to exploit its, its great power for analgesic properties, um, but do so in a different way. So we want to do this by making new allosteric modulators, and by that I mean anything that doesn't bind in the orthosteric site. So something that can bind and modulate the signaling properties of the receptor, but do so from a distinct pocket. So positive allosteric modulators can do a few different things. They can increase um, the biological response or efficacy of some orthosteric agonist, or they can increase that agonist's potency. Conversely, NAMs can decrease potency or decrease efficacy of that orthosteric ligand signaling response. There's a few benefits of allosteric modulators, including potentially subtripe specificity, as outside of the orthosteric pocket is much less evolutionarily conserved. Um, they have intrinsic sealing effects, which can be really helpful in limiting that final efficacy of the system. Um, probe dependence is something that I'll get back to at the end of the talk, where the, the molecule, the modulator can have different effects depending on which orthosteric ligand is present. Um, but basically what I want to do here is highlight the, the benefit of an allosteric modulator is that can enhance the signaling properties of existing systems. So for a positive allosteric modulator, we want one that will increase the body's endogenous opioid peptide response. Uh, the body has a great way of targeting the natural endogenous peptides to places where they're actually needed. So instead of kind of flooding the zone with morphine or fentanyl to promote some analgesic response, we'd like to enhance the body's natural ability to do that. Conversely, negative allosteric modulators may enhance Narcan's activity and reduce some of those effects where you need like a, a lot of different doses of Narcan to, to counteract uh, super potent fentanyl effects. So a few mu modulators exist, but they're largely low potency, difficult to work with, and nonspecific. Uh, a few mu positive allosteric modulator chemical series exist. These things are actually really promising anti-pain uh, relief molecules with decreased side effects, but they have pretty low potency and solubility. So new chemical scaffolds are pretty helpful, uh, as well as new mechanisms of action. There's a few negative allosteric modulators of the opioid receptor as well that have been characterized, uh, including salvinorin A, CBD, and THC. Unfortunately, these are much, much more potent against their natural receptors, kappa opioid receptor and, C and cannabinoid receptors than they are for mu. So this negative allosteric activity will never be really realized in vivo. Most importantly here, there's no structures and no cryo-EM or crystallography data for how these modulators are accomplishing their functions. Um, so this was sort of why we got started on this project. To discover new uh, chemical series, we turn to DNA encoded chemical libraries or DELs. So these are these libraries of small molecules uh, generated with combinatorial chemistry and attached to a barcode so that you can easily sequence, uh, read out what the small molecule is attached to or what the small molecule is at the end of the DNA strand just by deep sequencing. So they're constructed largely by attaching individual small building blocks to a piece of DNA along with a barcode that identifies what that fragment is. Then you can pool all of these compounds together and do a second round of addition onto the end here with a second barcode and third and fourth, et cetera, et cetera. So this is a pretty easy way of, if you can imagine doing a hundred building blocks in the first position, a hundred in the second and a hundred in the third of getting a million compound libraries. And when you mix all these together, um, now new days, new libraries are at least in the billions of compounds and some libraries have trillions of compounds. 
one of the nice uh, features of this is that these numbers of compounds can be in a really, really small volume uh, because of the nature of identifying hits. So deep sequencing is extremely sensitive, meaning we can get down to at atomal or lower concentrations of final molecules and pretty easily identify what they are. Um, so we can have all these molecules in about 10 microliters of solution, apply them to our target of interest, wash away what doesn't stick, and identify what has stuck by sequencing. So we wanted to design a selection scheme here that would allow us to identify positive and negative allosteric modulators of the mu opioid receptor. So to do this, we, um, we first targeted positive allosteric modulators by forming active complex of the mu opioid receptor bound to metenkeflin is a, a common opioid uh, endogenous peptide. And we added excess concentrations of this peptide to steer the molecules away from the orthosteric site. Uh, we also formed the fully active signaling complex with uh, GI1 as the G protein partner here to stabilize the fully active conformation of the receptor. Conversely, to select for negative allosteric modulators, we bound the mu opioid receptor to Narcan. Um, and anything that's enriched here, we would predict to be a negative allosteric modulator because it's not bound in the positive in the positive control. So the few controls after this are designed to remove things that will bind to G protein alone. So in this case, we have cannabinoid receptor bound to the same G protein partner as for the mu opioid receptor. So anything that enriches in both of these conditions is likely to be an, an uninteresting G protein modulator. Uh, and finally, the fourth sample here is a no target control to get rid of kind of greasy and, and unfavorable molecules. So we can pass this 4.4 billion compound library from Wuxi over all of these samples individually, um, wash away what doesn't bind and elute what's left and do a few rounds of enrichments, uh, after which we can sequence and identify what's been left in each of the conditions. So indeed, at the end of the day, we got a few series of, of small molecules that were selectively enriched to condition one, and we would predict these to be positive allosteric modulators. Uh, and they have no enrichment to any of the other conditions. Conversely, we selected uh, a really highly enriched population of uh, molecules for the uh, condition two, in this case, Narcan bound receptor that are not enriched in any of the other conditions. So we would predict these to be negative allosteric modulators of the receptor. So we turned again to the GTPase assay that I mentioned for the RAMP studies to do some initial hit testing here. So in this case, we're starting with 10 micromolar GTP, adding G protein alone, and we get some level of turnover after the, the time in the experiment. Uh, if we add APO receptor, so non-liganded mu opioid receptor, we see no further depletion in GTP. But if we add metenkeflin agonist bound receptor, we see a depletion in GTP relative to G protein alone. So for positive allosteric modulators, in the presence of this agonist, we would expect to see a further enhancement in turnover of the system. And indeed, for two out of the three uh, molecules we chose to synthesize here, we see a, a pretty substantial increase in turnover for the metenkeflin signaling. And the compound 368 that we selected as a negative modulator does indeed pretty potently inhibit turnover of the, of the system. So we chose a few molecules to continue here, uh, the 368 as a negative allosteric modulator and compound 69 as the most effective positive allosteric modulator of the, of the system. So here I'm showing you just a titration format of the same experiment before. Uh, it's not a great potency assay, but it gives us a rough estimate of the affinity of the molecule for the receptor. Um, so here, again, starting at, at zero concentration modulator, we see an agonist-dependent depletion in turnover, and this agonist-dependent depletion is enhanced in the presence of modulator. So it actually is a really great enhancer of turnover. Uh, so we can get all the way down to zero GTP at the highest concentrations here. Uh, the drawback being the potency of the molecule is not great, so it's double-digit micromolar in this assay. Uh, so for a more quantitative assay, we turned to radioligand binding and showed that when we bind hot naloxone to um, new opioid receptor expressing membranes, we can add in um, the positive modulator and stabilize the active state of the receptor, resulting in this, um, at least from what I've shown you, maybe or maybe not allosteric displacement of the naloxone. Finally, we can do the assay and look for the GTPase assay and look for basal signaling. So this is G protein alone. And here is receptor in the absence of orthosteric agonists. So this is uh, basal signaling of the receptor. 
And then when we add either the allosteric modulator compound 69 or the full agonist DAMGO, we get nearly the same levels of turnover. So this kind of classifies the, the positive allosteric modulator more as an, as an agonistic PAM than a true PAM on its own. Uh, and of course, when we mix these two together, a full agonist and the PAM, we see a full depletion of, of GTP, meaning full activity here. So we're interested in how uh, this compound 69 is able to promote this uh, signaling consequence of the mu opioid receptor. So to do this, we again turn to cryo-EM. Uh, we sort of use pretty conventional at this point G-protein uh, receptor complexing protocols and complex with GI in the presence of metenkeflin as the orthosteric agonist uh, and excess concentrations of the, the modulator for some time. Uh, before adding G protein and stabilizing SCFE and apyrase. We can purify complex, run it on size exclusion, and freeze grids. Uh, and then we're able to solve the structure here to 3.5 angstrom resolution and get pretty good um, definition of all of the transmembrane helices. So here's the density that we settle with for the final structure of the PAM bound to the active mu GI complex. Uh, in the presence of metenkeflin as the orthosteric agonist. Uh, so we see pretty reasonable density for metenkeflin here, which at the time was the first endogenous opioid bound to a receptor. But in the last week or two, there's been five structures or so published, so that's great. Um, but more importantly, we see pretty reasonable density for the positive allosteric modulator, compound 69, off of TM6 and TM7. Um, so this is pretty exciting for us because we don't see this density in any of the other uh, G-protein complexes with um, mu opioid receptor. So the endogenous peptide binding, I'll just go over briefly. It makes a series of contacts within the orthosteric pocket that are pretty conserved uh, between all of the endogenous opioids, as well as DAMGO as a, a reference agonist here in, in pink. Uh, DAMGO is a shorter peptide, so it makes a, a uh, salt bridge with TM6 at its C terminus, while metenkeflin is a bit longer, so it makes more greasy interactions with lower regions in TM6 and exposes its, its charge to solution. And this is consistent with some of the extended opioid peptide structures that were just published from Eric Chu, uh, which sort of extend this way off, uh, well, off over on top of ICL2. Um, but for the allosteric modulator, it's, it binds at the intracellular region kind of within the membrane of TM6 and TM7 and forms a series of largely hydrophobic interactions with these transmembrane helices, uh, though there is a cation pi between uh, arginine 280 and the naplamine moiety on the end of the compound um, to test whether this indeed was the pose that we think fits pretty well into the density. We ran some MD trajectories. And it seems to be pretty stable throughout the course of at least 200 nanoseconds. Uh, so we're in the process of running these further and looking into the dynamics of the system a bit more. So why is it a PAM? Um, to do this, we compared the structure that we have with an inactive crystal structure of antagonist bound mu opioid receptor. So when we look at the electrostatic surface potential of the active metenkeflin GI and the PAM bound structure, we can start to see that it actually does fit pretty nicely on top of this ledge exposed in the active form of TM6. Um, this pocket is just not present at all in the inactive conformation of TM6 in the inactive receptor. Um, the arginine has moved away completely from the binding site that we predict with the, the PAM, uh, and it actually starts to clash with the conformation of TM7 in the inactive form of the receptor. Um, so in this sense, it seems to be a PAM by stabilizing the active conformation of TM6 selectively. Uh, and this also explains why it's an agonistic PAM in that it can stabilize the active state in the absence of orthosteric agonists. All right, so I'll go a bit quickly. Um, okay, so we wanted to characterize the negative allosteric modulator next. So again, we titrated the modulator in the presence of orthosteric agonist and watched how it inhibited GTP hydrolysis. So in this case, we're titrating 368. Instead of an enhancement in turnover, we get a near complete inhibition upon uh, addition of the negative allosteric modulator. So again, when we titrate the compound in the presence of hot naloxone, instead of decreasing the binding of naloxone, we see a, a cooperative increase in binding of hot uh, naloxone to the, the mu opioid receptor membranes. And it also has a much more potent interaction in this effect. So it's 125 nanomolar instead of about 20 micromolar for the positive allosteric modulator. Uh, 
It can inhibit basal signaling. It can inhibit naloxone-induced signaling at the receptor. So naloxone is a very, very weak partial agonist of the, the mu opioid receptor. Uh, and it can also inhibit signaling from DEMGO as well as a variety of other orthosteric uh, agonists here. Uh, in cells, we were able to work with Tauche and Amal and get some really great true path data. So this is uh, data where we can look at BRET changes upon G protein activation. Um, we can look at GI, all the G proteins independently, and show that in this case, when we add morphine, we can activate uh, all six of these G proteins with some potency. But in the presence of the negative allosteric modulator, we get a nearly log fold right shift in that potency. The same thing happens with fentanyl and with metenkeflin, meaning we have uh, nearly 1.2 or 1.1 fold right shift in the potency curves for all G proteins. This G protein inhibition results also in a downstream cyclic AMP effect. So in this case, we can add agonist and watch a decrease in cyclic AMP because it's a GI pulled receptor. Uh, and when we do the same thing at an EC80 concentration of agonist, we can see uh, when we titrate in 368, we get an inhibition of this cyclic AMP uh, effect. So we were again interested in solving the structure of the GPCR, the mu opioid receptor bound to uh, the negative allosteric modulator. To do this, we had to turn to a different structural strategy, uh, relying on a nanobody as the fiducial marker instead of the G protein binding partner that we typically do for active structures. So in this case, we're taking the strategy of Mike Robertson in Yorgo's lab, uh, Yorgos Kiniotis, where he is able to fuse the kappa opioid receptor ICL3 onto a series of other class A receptors and take advantage of an inactive state stabilizing nanobody that provides a nice fiducial marker off of the detergent micelle to solve a series of, of cryo-EM inactive structures. So we took this strategy here to solve not just the, the antagonist naloxone, but also the structure of the, the negative allosteric modulator bound uh, receptor. Um, we froze a series of just perfect grids here and collected a lot of data and got the structure down to 3.26 resolution. Um, the naloxone forms a series of conserved interactions with the orthosteric site of the receptor. Uh, the only exception being the presence of the negative allosteric modulator in red on top, which forms a direct hydrogen bond with naloxone, as well as a series of interactions all across the extracellular vestibule of the receptor, uh, which is consistent with its pretty high potency. So the compound 368, the negative modulator here, I've overlaid uh, the structure in blue with the negative modulator and naloxone bound, and in green, the inactive state in the absence of modulator, and in orange is our present metenkeflin uh, active structure. So the binding of the NAM appears to force TM1 and 2 outwards away from the, the vestibule. Um, but I think more importantly for signaling, it clashes with some uh, active rotomers of histidine 319 and trip 3A in TM7, forcing TM7 into an even further inactive state relative to the crystal alone. So we next did some off-rate experiments to show that the NAM uh, actively promotes off-rate of orthosteric agonists from the system. Uh, so here we're adding hot naloxone at T equals zero to agonist bound receptor in black. And the agonist we chose has a really, really high potency here, so we don't see much on rate of the hot antagonist. But if we do the same experiment in the presence of negative allosteric modulator, we can actively increase the off rate of the orthosteric agonist. So conversely, um, it may increase the off rate of agonists, but it seems to de decrease the off rate of hot naloxone itself. Uh, it does this by sort of binding on top and stabilizing, but also decreasing access to solution. Uh, so conversely, when we uh, saturate with hot naloxone and initiate off rate with cold naloxone addition, uh, it falls off in about 2.8 minutes. But if we saturate with uh, the negative allosteric modulator, we not only increase binding to the receptor, but we don't see the naloxone fall off at all. So we next turn to a series of great uh, collaborators here, Sush and Jay, doing some chemistry and in vivo work uh, with us to characterize the negative allosteric modulator. Uh, so first in the pharmacokinetics, the molecule seems to enter the brain and stay there for a pretty long period of time. So it's active at active concentrations out to at least two hours. Um, we initially got some pretty counterintuitive uh, data with morphine alone in the absence of naloxone. So when you give mice um, morphine, you get this hyper locomotion effect that's kind of the opposite of what we see for humans. And if you pretreat with the negative allosteric modulator, you can nearly completely eliminate this effect in purple. But if we do the same thing with respiratory depression, morphine induces respiratory depression in red, followed by recovery. 
if we pre-saturate with the negative allosteric modulator, we actually elongate respiratory depression. So it acts as a NAM for hyperlocomotion, but a PAM for respiratory depression. And we think this effect is just because morphine and naloxone are extremely similar to each other. So some of these probe defendant effects that I was talking about earlier may be at play here, where the molecule is actually increasing the potency of morphine. So I'll just end on a few more in vivo slides here. So um, the molecule seems to act cooperatively with naloxone. So while it has counterintuitive effects with morphine on its own, uh, J next tested against subsaturating doses of naloxone. So morphine on its own induces this pain relief effect with the tail flick assay that lasts about an hour and a half. And when we add a subsaturating dose of naloxone, um, we don't really see much effect on the pain relief at all. But if we do the same thing in the presence of increasing doses of our negative allosteric modulator, we can nearly completely eliminate morphine-induced uh, pain relief responses uh, for the system, um, sort of showing that the molecule has to work cooperatively with naloxone for its activity to, to be fully there. Um, the last slide here, it works as a Narcan booster for these morphine side effects. So in addition to pain relief, we're interested in testing the hyperlocomotion and respiratory depression effects of morphine. Uh, so morphine, again, induces a hyperlocomotive response and a respiratory depression response in mice. Um, when we add the, the NAM on its own, it doesn't really seem to have a major effect on either of these in vivo behaviors. But if we do the same thing in the presence of increasing, uh, increasing amounts of NAM with a low dose of naloxone, we can uh, potentiate that naloxone effect and start to see an inhibition of the hyperlocomotion effect. And most importantly for opioid overdoses, uh, at the highest doses of NAM in conjunction with naloxone, we can nearly completely eliminate the respiratory depression effects of, of morphine. Okay, so I hope with the second half I've shown you we can design this library selection strategy to avoid orthosteric molecules and steer towards positive and negative allosteric modulators. Hopefully this is transferable to any other GPCR system. We selected a new mu positive allosteric modulator and solved the first structure of a modulator-bound uh, mu opioid receptor and show it acts by stabilizing the active state of TM6. We discovered a pretty high affinity negative allosteric modulator of the opioid receptor, um, and it inactivates the receptor and increases the affinity of Narcan by binding on top of the extracellular vestibule here. Uh, it's also active in mice in conjunction with Narcan, so we're looking forward to further optimizing this molecule uh, and exploring uh, better drug-like PAMs and NAMs from future DEL screens. Uh, as well as the effects not just on structures, but on the, the dynamics of the mu opioid receptor. So I have to thank a lot of people here. So everyone in Brian's lab, Brian's a, a great mentor uh, for all of these projects and many more. Kavya is a great collaborator on especially the RAMP project and many, many other projects I wasn't able to talk about today. She's kind of my partner in crime in the Kabilka lab. Uh, Chris Habrian is a transplant from Udi Isakoff's lab at Berkeley, and these guys uh, did all the single molecule experiments with us. Uh, Hao Ching has worked on all of the cryoEM for both projects throughout the, the talk today. And Daniel is a former postdoc in Brian's lab who got the glucagon receptor and ramp system up and going in lab. Susan Marcus's lab at Berkeley and especially Naomi collected all of the hydrogen exchange mass spec data. Zealand, uh, Pharma with Jesper and Inga were super important for the solubilized glucagon that I didn't really have a huge chance to talk about today, as well as the, the cyclic AMP data for the opioid project. Um, Jay McLaughlin and Sush are, are in vivo and chemistry collaborators. Um, so we're really looking forward to working with these guys more with further derivatives of these molecules. Tao Che collected the, the true path data for the negative allosteric modulator. Our cryoEM resources, Liz at the Stanford cryoEM Center and uh, George at Slack, uh, were awesome uh, collaborators on both of these projects. Um, the glucagon receptor ramp manuscript uh, should be out at the end of the month, so please check that out. And there's a bioarchive version available now. Um, I'm really happy to take questions as well. Ooh, thank you, Evan. Very fruitful and dense presentation. Thank you very much a lot of interesting results. So now I will open a few quick questions uh, to the audience. So I saw Theo got his hands up. So Theo. Hi, thanks for the awesome presentation. I mean, I, uh, I'm particularly interested in the inactive cryo-EM structure you guys have. So I was wondering if you had uh, any problems with preferential orientation of the N96 GPCR 
complex once you put it on grids and maybe if you had to use like secondary detergents or something if you had that problem so surprisingly no um we didn't have a massive problem with orientation bias for the system um i will say that might be a little bit confused by the fact that the processing is really tricky in general for such a small fiducial marker mm -hmm. um so we had to do a lot of back and forth and sort of rescue particles that were inappropriate classified inappropriately classified into lower resolution um classes here so the processing at least with the nanobody alone is a bit tricky but we got to pretty high resolution uniform density so there in the final data set there was not much evidence of orientation bias um, but I will add, he now has a, a, a slightly bigger scaffold with the universal fab off of the nanobody, uh, and that can add a good deal more density off of the micelle for these inactive structure determination approaches. So I think he's had a bit more luck on the processing end, uh, and it's a bit more streamlined. Great. Thank you. Thanks, Evan. Really interesting talk. Um, can you hear me? Yep. Yeah, good. Um, so I want to ask you a little bit about your ramp stuff. So firstly, I mean, really um, very nice um, in vitro data on the, the action. Um, in terms uh, of your cryo structure, I so first fun question. Um, when you're doing the ECD dynamics um, and you're labeling the, the far end terminus, is it? Yeah. Is with the fluorescence change, yeah does that not change the the receptor pharmacology so we've not seen because i know if we put yeah. like flag tags on the terminus, we get a you know substantive right shift in the potency of the glucagon for example so in this case it is sorry one second um so it's not the extreme end terminus. It is right at the end of the end terminal helix. Um, so you're right in that this region of the receptor seems really, really sensitive to perturbations. So Daniel and Kavya, uh, before my time here, have screened probably 20 locations for cysteine insertion into the extracellular domain before settling on this one, at least from um, in vivo characterization of the potency cyclic AMP curves with Jesper to try to minimize that inhibition effect. And this was yeah. the one site that worked. Okay, cool. Um, so that was so, the motivation. Yeah. In terms of your cryo-EM data, um, the way I would interpret your data is, is your ramp fell off. Mm -hmm. And it's not actually there. Uh, and it's not contributing to what you're looking at in your cryo-EM. Yeah, so we have, this is a, a pretty clear interpretation of what we have, right? So we have frozen these grids in the presence of sex stable complex for four times now. And we similarly see no extracellular domain. So if it's a question of when the ramp has fallen off, it may have fallen off during freezing. But if it has done so, it has done so in an effort uh, in much quicker time scale than the ECD can bounce back, right? So if if it's falling off at well, some point I mean, before it, it freezing, really you'd expect depends a little bit on on what you're expecting for your dynamics um, and the extent to which you've done the exact comparators and the number of times that you see that the sort of coordinated motions between ECD and the base of the receptor. I mean, we see that with basically every class B GPCR. So that's not really an unusual finding, from my perspective, at least. Um, yeah, it's just the global lack of density in the extracellular domain that's pretty consistent with other, you know, in-solution measurements as well. Uh, and we also have done this in sort of a cross-linking fashion where we can covalently link the, the receptor and the ramp together. And while we don't have a high resolution structure of this, we do see them as two extracellular domains sort of into the... Uh, extracellular face in a more parallel fashion rather than what you might see for the clamped on top sort of calcitonin yeah. receptor structures. So but, but if I recall that correctly, you don't actually see complexes with G protein when the ranch present. Uh, that was in an antagonist bound confirmation. So when we do the same thing and try to get high resolution structures in the absence of G protein partner, 
the extracellular domains of the two partners are too flexible to service fiducials off of the micell to get high resolution information. Yeah. So we I see a bunch the, of protein containing empty micelles that are not having any extracellular right. domains. But if you do your cross linking with agonist and G protein, do you get full complex or do you get the receptor and G protein and receptor, sorry, the receptor and G protein all that yeah. and the receptor and RAM separately because that's what was in your bioarchive submission. E, yeah, sorry. I can go back and check. Sorry, I do not remember. Um, and that, that wouldn't be consistent with your other data, which basically suggests that um, if your G protein is bound, your RAMP is not likely to be happy, right? Because yeah, they seem to be competitive. Is true. Um, yeah. So I, I, I you know, would be surprised to be seeing it in the, under the circumstances of, of your data. And then it just, from my perspective, then it becomes difficult to interpret what you're seeing there as a RAMP dependent phenomenon because I, I don't expect it's actually there in the particles that you pick that have the G protein bound. That would be my interpretation. Um, but I like all the other bits, <laughs> uh, which I thought were really fascinating. Thank you. Since we have gone through the time of the heaven, so uh, I think you take one more question. Okay. So Cool, Jason. Um, hey, Evan. Um, it's Jason from MIPS. Um, can you hear me? Yep. Okay. Uh, sorry, just uh, following the question or the other interpretation from Patrick um, about the uh, falling apart of RAM from your complex, because I noticed why, like uh, the protocol in your lab is they will purify the, each component and assemble them as a complex in the end, right? So it's kind of different from our routine protocol. We co-express RAM and the receptor together. But during your during going through your protocol, I noticed by the receptor was purified in the present or LM and G, which is really a slow K of detergent. The RAM is purified with a rapid dissociated detergent DDN. And you kind of like uh, do the detergent exchange between them from the DDM of RAM to LM and G. But I just wondering whether because the LM and G is really slow off rate. So actually I cannot imagine that doing one hour incubation, the transmembrane domain of RAP will get attached to the transmembrane domain of a receptor because it kind of like prevented by the presence of LM and G detergent. So my suggestion might be actually due to some inter interaction between the ECD of RAM and receptor, this RAM to attach to their complex and the micelle, but actually they do not have the transmembrane domain interaction solid. And that will cause the uh, dissociation during the vitrification, or it's kind of like trigger the falling apart in the following space. But as you mentioned before, you said it might falling apart during the vitrification. Do you have some negative stain of your sample? In that way, they do not have the freezing steps and you might see some ramp density or ramp ECD, or you just skip the negative stain and subject to cryo -year. We broadly skip negative stain and okay. go to cryo -EM. Um, Yeah. My only point with the lack of MNG mm -hmm. off rate is that we do yeah. have the presence of DDM. And so technically they are mixed micelles with a much more changed, you know, kinetic behavior between the samples. Okay. And yeah, we yeah. also have hydrogen exchange measurements at much, much lower concentrations that suggest the transmembrane of ramp mm -hmm. is indeed interacting with receptor. Um, yeah. So even after, you know, much shorter incubations for the hydrogen exchange experiments, we see mm -hmm. Uh, some evidence of productive interaction in, within the TMs. Um, and the ramp complexing receptor is overnight. So that one we do for a much, much longer period of time to try to force mm -hmm. the interaction to happen in the presence of yeah. GS or else as, as Patrick suggested, we probably would not mm -hmm. see any complex at all. Um, so the only yeah. like countervailing theory is that this thing is ex like surprisingly stable in the presence of GS. And usually we can get structures of molecules that are not quite this sex stable. 
Um, yeah. There may be some freezing behavior phenomenon that we're, you know, misinterpreting as a uh, differentially interpreting as a dynamic phenomenon, but it's yeah. all sort of in our mind, semi internally consistent with hydrogen exchange experiments and other fluorescence measurements. But cool. Thank you. Yeah. I know the ramp on the other member of the class B GP so is quite difficult, but thank you for all your piece of work and it makes the work better. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so um, could I just quickly close up or thank every audience and Evan to present his wonderful work. And then if Evan is happy to stay for a little bit longer, we can allow other audience to ask a question if they are um, willing to. But first of all, I will thank Evan again deeply to show his wonderful work on both cloud em and the uh, htex and uh, as well as nmr very wonderful and then i will also thank all the audience that join us from everywhere today and this uh, seminar will be um, available online as well so just check on our website to um, if you want to review that so to that i will thank everyone again